I want to make a comment about the Surangama or Shurangama Sutra that I've been reciting on an unabridged basis, specifically the Charles Luck translation. I have uploaded some of the sections up through chapter 4 onto my own channel with various photographs associated with the, the content. And of course, my friend Sean is going to be uploading the whole thing with English and Chinese text. And this is a rather massive undertaking. And I have to acknowledge that two things. One, it's a lot of work, uh, but uh, that that's self-evident. The, the, the reason I'm making this video, though, is to say there's a lot of the content that carries to my mind the profundity of the other Mahayana texts, such as the Prajnaparamita and, and others. But there are also sections within this sutra that are pretty, uh, I, I can only use the term moralistic, okay? And I think that's okay in the context in which I think it was utilized, which was basically as a teaching tool for, for monks. But I feel like I have to put on a bit of a warning label for anybody who's not a monk and say, you know, if you try to actually listen to what is being recommended and, and prohibited, that this is very, very difficult to do. It's virtually impossible to do unless you're in a monastic community and committed to a life of celibacy and, and, and really monastic purity in, in the full sense of that word. So just be careful if you're reading this sutra or listening to it. Now, at the end of these sections regarding the, the prohibitions and whatnot, or the hells, which again, I'm not all that comfortable, you know, having uh, as part of the uploads on my channel. But, you know, I think that what you ultimately have to hear using Avalokiteshvara's <laughs> ideal modality for attaining enlightenment that Manjushri endorses, namely the hearing mode, that what you end up hearing is that these things are not real. These are, as the Lotus Sutra might say, expedient devices. These are ways to help followers of the Buddha path to gain greater altruism, greater attentiveness and conformity to the Eightfold Path, to the Six Paramitas, and so forth. But that... We also have to keep in mind the Heart Sutra. In other words, that all entities, persons, dharmas, teachings are empty of a true independent self-nature. So I just wanted to extend this little caveat and uh, for any of you who are watching my channel or listening to these videos, and there are some who are really following these segments of the Surangama in a, in a very faithful, serious-minded way to say that just be careful not to judge yourself too harshly if you can't immediately conform to the various kinds of expectations that are embedded within this, within this much revered sutra. That said, I trust there will be merit derived from the efforts that are being put into it by myself and, and Sean and, and the other people who will be involved in doing the multi-voice version of this sutra on the YouTube channels. And I'm not saying that it's not a wonderful, wonderful sutra. I'm just saying that it includes elements that have to be, have to be heard and and implemented in terms of our decision making and our actions with respect to our own lives in a way that respects the fact of what our limitations are as human beings. And of course, that leads to what my own path is, which is pure land Buddhism. And so I've acknowledged long ago that I'm not capable of, of fulfilling these things. But I do enjoy reciting Buddha Dharma, and I do believe that different components of the Buddha Dharma can be related to by different individuals with different personality types and so forth. And so I'm happy to, to provide this opportunity for exposure to this, again, much revered sutra. And uh, I hope that uh, you will take it in the spirit that it's offered. Namo Mita Bodhs. Namo Mita Bodhs. Namo Mita Bodhs.
Now, I thought about ending this video right at that point after saying the Nembutsu, but I thought I would add a few clarifying comments. One, just to reflect on what the reality is in terms of what the expectations are as far as precepts within Chinese Mahayana Buddhism, I think we need to reflect on the fact that Buddhists in China, Korea, Taiwan, and Vietnam follow the Vinaya, or precepts, within Buddhism, which is one of the main sort of categories of scriptures within Buddhism. They follow 253 rules. That's for the bhikshus, or the male monks. As far as the females, the bhikshunis, they have to follow 348 rules. So this gives you a framework for understanding this Sarangama Sutra in terms of it being a Mahayana Sutra that was primarily revered in China, where, again, the expectations of the monks and nuns with respect to their level of purity was just extraordinary. So that makes the point I was actually trying to highlight in the, in the video, in the earlier part of this sort of two-phase video. But, you know, that doesn't mean that there were no precepts associated with the lay folk within Chinese Buddhism. And in particular, here we have the five precepts. And these precepts actually are basic sort of ethical guidelines for Buddhists within all, or at least almost all, Buddhist traditions. So, according to Wikipedia, just to share a few facts in this regard, the five precepts represent the most important system of morality for Buddhist lay people. They constitute the basic code of ethics to be undertaken by lay followers of Buddhism. The precepts are commitments to abstain from killing living beings, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, and intoxication. So within the Buddhist doctrine, these are meant to develop mind and character to make progress on the path to enlightenment. Now another point I want to make that was emphasized to me in the context of my communication with my colleague Sean, who uploads my videos in a form that includes English and Chinese text on the screens, he made the point that Part of the reason for the focus on within the, the, the Charles Luck translation, chapter 7 and 8, as to some of the pitfalls for mo more advanced uh, practitioners, as well as some of the sort of risks that the, the practitioner uh, runs in terms of the potential for being affected by so-called demons or the potential for having various kinds of retribution for not following the path in a, in a pure kind of uh, extremely rigorous way, is not only to give input to the monks as to what they need to be careful about and what they need to guard against, but also what it does, and this is an interesting point, it gives information, the Sharanga, the Sharangama does, it gives information to the lay people as to what they can and should be looking for in a teacher, to make a determination as to whether that teacher is in fact the genuine article, so to speak, in other words, somebody who truly is a sincere and genuine and committed Buddhist practitioner, as opposed to somebody who may be, in in some ways, a, a, a type of heretic or a type of person whose, whose communication to the laity is not consistent with the best of the Buddhist ideals. So again, it can be a guidepost or, or a sort of basis for the lay person sort of testing or evaluating his or her teacher. And then there's the point made by Ron Epstein and David Rounds in their introduction to the Buddhist Text Translation Society, Shurangama Translation, where they make the point that part of the purpose of the Shurangama giving these various warnings to the monks is to sort of counteract what maybe some of the tendencies were at that time and, and what arguably can occur in this day and age as far as as sort of corruption of, of the monastery or of a given monk or nun in terms of their potential to deviate from the true teachings, kind of like the Tani Show does for us Shin Buddhists in terms of deviations from Shinran's teachings. But again, in their introduction, they address this particularly with respect to uh, sort of cautions for those following the esoteric path, which of course evolved into Tantric Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism. And uh, by the way, I have a separate video covering how the content of the Sharangama correlates with some of the other Mahayana Buddhist traditions, according to Epstein and Rounds, and you can see that in a, a link that I'll include in the description below.
But with respect to esoteric teachings, they say, the esoteric teachings, also known as Buddhist Tantra or Vajrayana, include various methodologies of meditation and other practices that are often privately transmitted from teacher to disciple in formal transmissions or empowerment rituals. And we can see right there, just on the face of it, the potential for exploitation if the guru or teacher, in a sense, is doesn't have the best interest of the disciple or the follower in mind. So these esoteric practices include the recitation of mantras, sometimes in coordination with mudras or ritual dispositions of the hands, and the use of ritual implements, and also teachings about the visualization of deities, the ritual creation of sacred spaces or mandalas, and the making of elaborate offerings. Now here's their point, that the central chapter of the Sharangama, which in the BTTS version is part 8, there is described certain of these practices in detail, and moral purity is an essential prerequisite for all the esoteric practices. So they want to make the point here, Epstein and Rounds do, that, that the reason the sutra contains strong warnings about the dangers of moral impurity is because impurity became widespread in many of the early Indian Buddhist tantric circles. And they further make the point that since that time, Failure to recognize the necessity of moral purity has been a frequent pitfall for a significant number of teachers and students of the esoteric teachings, both in Asia and in the West. And finally, as a postscript to the earlier phase of this video, I want to share what the perspective is of Dharma Master Heng Shur, uh, whom I have just a tremendous amount of respect for. He's at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery which is a Mahayana Buddhist organization that comes, I believe, from the lineage of the Chinese sort of Buddhist tradition. And he certainly was a key leader in the development of this Buddhist Text Translation Society translation of the Sharangama Sutra. And that, that version, by the way, has excerpts from the commentary by the Venerable Master Swan Hua, who was Heng Shur's teacher. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. But first, in terms of Heng Shur's perspective of the, the way in which the Shurangama helps him as a monk, as a committed Mahayana Buddhist monk, as he conducts himself in his daily activities and daily Buddhist practices. He says in the foreword to that translation, he says, Over the years, when I have needed advice and cultivation, I have referred to the Shurangama Sutra for authoritative information. I go to the 50 demonic states of mind, which in the BTTS is part 10, to check on strange states in meditation. He says, I go to the 25 sages, or part 6 in that translation, for encouragement on the path from the voices of bodhisattvas. And he says, I go to the four clear and definitive instructions on purity, which is part 7 in BTTS, for clarity on interaction with the world. For example, there, I find the Buddha's reasons for advocating a harmless plant-based diet. And he's very big on vegetarianism, as perhaps we all should be, and that over the course of time, hopefully humans will evolve beyond their carnivorous tendencies. But that's a sidebar. And finally, in order to gain more appreciation for the meaning of the Sharangama, Again, I would certainly recommend the Buddhist Text Translation Society, the new translation that has these excerpts from the Venerable Master Swan Hua. But just to give a little bit of additional information in that regard, in the eight-volume version, there are much more elaborated elements of Master Swan Hua's commentary. And so if you really want to drill down deep into the meaning of this and to get a sort of a classical Orthodox Chinese Mahayana Buddhist perspective, uh, you might want to actually access a, a multi-volume version of the wonderful Sharangama Sutra. Namo Buddhas. Namo Buddhas. Namo Buddhas.